Um, I want to say thank you first of all to Sharon and the rest of the Chonking committee for letting us here and allowing our breed to shine on the same platform as yours. That's, that's brilliant of you. Um, okay, so my name is Junior. I am the founder of Genesis Red Dog Kennels and I'm the co-founder of the Chinese Red Dog Registry that we created in 2021. Um, I'll tell you about the history of the breed. This is one of my dogs here bred by... Uh, bred by Amos, who's actually the grandfather of, of this dog here as well. Um, Leizu Hong. Leizu is the province in which the dog was created. And Hong simply translates as red. So, which is why we call it the Chinese red dog. Yeah. Um, the dog made its first appearance in the 19th century when the German soldiers um, inhabited Shandong province and other places in China. Um, with them, they brought a population of dogs I'm sure it was a number of dogs that be in an army, but the two to note is German Shepherd and Rottweiler, as far as we know. Um, they were bred with many other local um, dogs at the time. Two that always come up is the Xi'an Hound, which I don't have any visuals of, but the other one is the Kuming Dog, which is this one here. It is what you'd simply probably refer to as Chinese version of a German Shepherd. It's your typical herding, pointy-eared, wolfy-looking dog. Um, I think this is probably the majority of the makeup of, of, of this dog, but um, we'll, we'll talk about that a bit later. Um, Utility-wise, they've been used. We, we're told they were used in the military. Um, if we go forward, we have these pictures here. Me personally, I look at today's red dog and I look at that and I say that that's not a red dog. Yeah. But this is what we're told and this is some of the issue with the red dog at the moment. I, I, I have listened to some of you guys speaking about the Chongqing and we are not that far ahead at all. Everything we hear or are told present is pretty much anecdotal. Yeah? Um, you buy a dog from China and they'll be like, his dad is big, strong dog in the village and everybody knows him, famous dog. That is, that's you. That's all you're getting. All right? So yeah, they're also used to herd animals. Now this is not going to be like your top Yorkshireman, come by, come by and the dog's doing loads of crazy stuff. Yeah, <laughs> No, it, it, it doesn't work like that. What this dog will do is just to stand, it's going to move your sheep the way it is. I have videos of this. Again? I've seen the, the videos on China. Yeah, they, yeah, I mean, they, 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 do, they do the job. The, the red dogs that I see doing this are not like this. They are typically a lot more slender and they, they move. Um, which makes me think other things as well, but we'll get to that. Uh, they are also used for domestic guarding and, uh, unfortunately, fighting. I have videos of fighting, but there's no point in me putting pictures here because we all know what that looks like and it's not cool. Um, what I would say is that it's not necessarily our place or position to judge them for what they've been doing and how they live for many years in China, but it is in our place and power to do better for them now that they're here. In 2016, when I first inquired, late 2016, when I first inquired about getting the Chinese Red Dog from a local kennels, um, I was told that it was German Shepherd, Great Dane, and Doberman. <coughs> that would have been very easy for to just take that and run with it. Like, yeah, because actually, when you look at this, this is my boy Amos. I love him. He's beautiful. Um, when you when you when you look at them, I think because you haven't seen anything else like this before, your mind goes straight to Doberman, and that is also probably subconsciously helped a lot by Hollywood's 1990 depiction of a Doberman pinprick tears, black and tan, muscular. But we know that the main thing being the ears, Dobermans don't look like this. You know? um, also, after the first dog was brought in by that kennel, we, when I say we, I'm talking loosely about the foundation people who were bringing dogs in at the time, because there was a time when we actually used to speak to each other. Okay? Um, Typical that trouble. person, yeah, yeah. But um, that person, the, who we then used as an agent, he used to go around and source from farmers and other such people, not maybe just people who had a dog and were willing to sell, because these dogs are mainly in rural China where the conditions are poor, a lot poorer than, say, Hong Kong. 
he got us some information and some bite-sized bits from the CKU. And that's when we was told that it was Rottweiler and not Doberman. Mm -hmm. Having said that, to date, from all of the DNA um, tests that have been done, that you speak to people about, Rottweiler and Great Dane has made minimal to no appearance whatsoever. What you do get is 50% around thereabouts percent of German Shepherd in, in these dogs. Yeah. They talk a lot. They talk a lot. Very vocal. Oh, very vocal. Very vocal. Uh, I didn't know that. And uh, if I did, I would have moved out of London before I got 10 of them. And uh, yeah, my mum, I, I was at my mum's at the time. She, we only just started talking again recently. <laughs> so yeah, basically, I would, I would question a lot of the history that we have at the moment. I don't think that these dogs are necessarily at the top of the list for the CKU. What I did, I, I know that they fight them and I know that they were part of the meat trade. What's the horrible fact is that they have a rapid rate of growth. So when you're talking about meat, obviously, all right? But we don't deal with dogs like that here. And actually, it's, it's brilliant that they are here. So maybe we can do a lot for them now they are for the lot that we have. Well, that's better, I hope not. That's not a plan. So it's between 2018 and 2022. No, 2018 and 2020, which the UK saw its first main bloodlines arrive, which would be Amos, my boy, Nash for Chinese Red Dog UK, and Lazarus for Ben DDR Dogs. Um, I'm from a security background, so when I first got these dogs, the first thing I did was go to my training club, once they were of age, and I wanted to see what kind of garden work they would do. And I'm not going to lie, their display of defence and the aggression was, it was off the chain. Everybody in the club was like, oh my gosh, wow. I then went on to post, because I wanted to, I wanted to um, I'm, I'm a licensed handler, by the way, and I have been for years. I've worked with the police. I've done lots of weapon sweeps from the street. So it wasn't irresponsible. It wasn't no back. I was at a proper um, training club. However, I then went on to the working groups, because I wanted to show everybody what they were like and what they could be capable of. And straight away, the narrative was, oh my God, they're going to take over the Mali. They're going to take over the German Shepherd. The, the Americans hated me. And they gave me a cyber beating every single time I posted a picture of a red dog. All I could hear was, does it bite? Does it have a full bite? Oh, I bet it can't take pressure. It won't take pressure, will it? Does it do IPO, KNVP, Mondiori? And then they rubbished the dog. And I was almost a laughing stock. I'm not going to mention the name of the groups because actually I'm quite friend, good friends with the owners of that group who all started at the same club. But it's the kind of narrative within the working dog world that they have. So I stepped away from that because I, I couldn't understand how you can rubbish a dog that has only been there for five minutes or even expect it to do IPO or anything like that when you can clearly see from the history, the little history we have, they've done nothing of the sort. And of course, Mali's, Herders, German Shepherds, along with their genetics, have had years and years of selective and purposeful breeding. Yeah? These dogs have not. So I wanted to uh, champion them and show them for what they could do. I do not know, I did not know at the time what they could do or what they were capable of, but the idea is, I guess, to find them so they're not just, just flying in the wind around the UK, just a couple of dogs. Okay? Um, I honestly believe that what we have with the red dog is not a tool, it's not a drill, it's not a screwdriver, it's not a saw. What I think we have with the red dog is the raw materials. We have the wood, we have the metal, and it's on us to be the carpenters or the blacksmiths to make of it what we will from what they give us. Yeah? And depending on how we treat them, I think they'll give us quite a lot. Obviously, a lot of you can see in certain breeders you're going to go to, you're going to see a lot hanging off the ends of the leads. Rah, chief. But you can see this dog right here. These dogs make brilliant house dogs, pets. I know I'm not going to advocate for all of them as that, but I, I've seen them sitting down, they'll watch EastEnders with you. They have a good switch off. They just want to chill, and they'll pretty much, they're not one people dog either. Um, they'll pretty much take affection from their family group, whoever's willing to give it. The breed standard. A lot of people have asked me for the breed standard. I've looked at the breed standard a couple times. Um, this was sent to us through a book through the guy who acts as an agent in China. Um, the problem with it, and why I don't show it to everybody, is this. It gives 
clear and definitive guidelines that we should be working to in some areas. So you can see male dogs should be 64 up to the withers, between 64 and 79 centimetres. Females, it gives that. But then it will go into other things. We won't go through all of them because there's loads of them. Okay. Let's go through. There you go. So then you get to things like this, and this is constantly through it. There's lots of the pages, and I think as well it should be squished down to the things that are important. You'll get something like this where it says the head should be strong and not too massive. That doesn't make sense because strength doesn't equate to size and size doesn't equate to strength in that. Yeah? So what should be there is actually a measurement in some sort of the skull, whether you're doing it from the back to the muzzle or whatever, you need to set goals so that actually there can be something that's dead, adhered to. And it will keep going like this through all of them. Um, you can just swipe through a couple of them. There, there'll be some which you think, all right, that's good. I can work with that. And there'll be others which then you look at and you realize uh, that, that doesn't make sense. It's too much space. Now, I mean, I don't know if it, all of you are my group here. I'll, I've got some cards that I'll leave for you afterwards. And when I leave, I'll post up pictures of all the different kinds of red dogs that you can see. In China, I don't believe they are treated as a pure breed. As much as they talk when they are selling you a dog, I don't believe that they are treated as a pure breed. I think they're treated as a type. And I think that in different provinces, depending on what they're using it for, just like the herding, where you see the more slender, whippet speed type dogs, they, I think that historically, in different provinces, different things will be inside of these dogs. Obviously, all of us who went there at the time and were getting dogs were roughly from around the similar circle of people. So there is a general look that we have here, but I will show you. I mean, there's some dogs that are about that high and like this, and you know that there's some sort of bulldog in there or something, do you know what I mean? Yeah. How do we fix this? All the breed, uh, a lot of you may know me on Facebook and you know that I've opened the registry. This is not to compete with the CKU. This is to do what we need to do here. And when we get to the stages that the Chong King is at, all the information should be there for us just to be like, there you go, have it. All that collected data. The problem is, is that not everybody wants to do that. Some people want to register it in this registry here, or this one's free on the internet here, or this bull breed, they'll take it, let's go there. If they are, or some just won't register them at all. If that happens, then yeah, there's, there's no meaning to what we're doing. If they can be registered in one place, we ourselves, the register is set up so there's people who do the work themselves. They will make averages, they'll make documentations, and they will say what needs to be said and documented so that people can see what kind of parameters we need to work with in, whether it's the eye color, the coat. <coughs> there, are, there are actually red dogs with lots of different coats. I have, I, I have quite a few. So I, I can see that there's lots of variations. Even when you have a litter, within that litter, there is a lot of variations in the type of dog that you get. So this is what needs to happen. There needs to be, they all need to be in one place so we can collect the information and move forward with it. Okay? Do, 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 do. Socialization. Before I sold any dog, a lot of people here don't know, but I have a lot of the dogs out here whether it's my breeding or whether it's a breeding with Mel Russell at the beginning when it started, Chinese Red Dog UK and myself used to work together. And if you dig deep enough back on the original Chinese Red Dog UK group, you will, you will see my dogs. Um, sorry, I'm just losing myself here, guys. When I broke away from that, I uh, decided... It was around about the same times as well that the Americans had given me a beating and I kind of stepped away from social media a bit. I started Genesis, Genesis Red Dog Kennels. And what I did was, before I sold any dog, I placed them all into different environments. So I had a litter and I gave a number of different dogs. And this is throughout my litters, I still do it now. I put them into different environments. So the first three, one, the three environments that I chose, I chose a single lady and an apartment flat in Manchester. And that was a big dog. Didn't know it at the time, but it was big. Sometimes I looked at it and I was like, Ooh, I, I don't know how this is going to go. It was like a bull in a china shop. But let's see what happens. The second dog I put into a family group, busy, high energy family group, ages from three to 18 at the time. So I could imagine, I know how chaotic it was because I've been there. Let's see what happens with that dog. The second dog, 
third dog I put into a sort of bachelor pad situation. It was an ex-military person. They lived there. I know that the lads were always around. They go to the pub. They go rock climbing and all kinds of different stuff. And uh, every single one of these dogs thrived to their different environment. You know, whether it was with the kids. A lot of people would worry about a dog this size bounding around with little kids. But they knew. They knew. They, they seemed to understand how to behave. The lady in the flat in Manchester, perfect. Perfect. No problems there. Other than the other little niggles, how do, how, how do I teach them to down? How do I teach them to sit? That, that's easy. You can work with that. It's the behavioural aspect of things that you need to worry about. The dog that went with the military guys is probably the most heavily environmentally exposed dog um, in the UK. If not the Western world, I would say. The guy who owns it constantly causes controversy on my page by saying silly stuff, but he is ex-military, and sometimes those people, excuse me if there's any here, my brother is also one, sometimes they shouldn't speak in public because their humour <laughs> is very different to what normal people would expect. Okay? However, that dog goes everywhere with you. Most of the pubs in Manchester know that dog. Most of the mountains that they go peeking over. The yeah. Right, right. She's actually, she's, she's actually the dog that did a breeding. I'm not sure if you know the dogs. There's a dog called Chong, which is a derivative of um, Chinese Red Dog UKs. And she did a breeding with him. She is actually the softest dog you will meet. She will not do protection work. She will not do anything like that. She is social. If I bring her in here, she'll walk around your tables, have a sniff, and probably just find somewhere just to chill and listen to me. Make an idiot of myself. So, um, yeah, so if we click back. Back or next one? Is it next one? No, back to the kids. <coughs> they bond strongly with their family group. Very strongly. This is Jeff A and her, her real owner, Chung Mei. They're doing shows already. And I think they've won a couple of shows, which is brilliant. And actually their relationship is, uh, is, is really nice for him. He's actually quite, he's qu quite a bit bigger than her. This is Link. He is one of my secret favorites, not so secret anymore, because he's very unique in his look. Um, and that is his owner, Leighton. And they are documented all over their pages, if you check them. They, they are completely fine. And Link has actually got quite a bit about him but he knows the difference. They are naturally suspicious and can have a lot of nerve. So if you don't socialise them, the way that they bond with their family group, whether it's resource garden or whatever, the problem you're going to have is that as soon as somebody of a different... If someone who doesn't come to your house regularly comes to your house, this is going to be a problem because they're, they're very territorial. I don't say that as if it's a permanent fault because actually there's a lot of them that as long most of them, if you train them from an early stage, they will be fine. They, they, they will bark or give you a little growl, but then they will get past it and they're actually very socially viable. A lot of people bought their dogs in the lockdown. This meant that a lot of their dogs could not be socialised properly. So, and that is the majority of the people who message me, whether the dogs are bred by me or not, message me and say, ah, oh, you know, my dog is not doing this, my dog is not doing that, or he is doing this, he's lunging at people. He's uh, lunging at cars. I see a lot of people on Facebook doing stuff when they first get their dog and they do things like, it's between my legs. And they do all these other tricks. But if you can't walk your dog down the road, there's no point. Yeah? If you can't socialise your dog, all of that training stuff with food, it makes no sense because you're only going to be able to do it in the front room. When you take it outside, it's not going to be able to compute everything else that's going on around it. Um, you can spend a lot of your time as well doing stuff that you see on the internet, making your dog chase a guy with a sleeve under gunfire, smoke bombs, all of this kind of stuff. But if you are now walking your dog at midnight so that your dog does not see anybody, what is the point? The dog is beautiful. And I was saying before, to Zeke's owners that I used to love walking down the road when I first got these dogs. I'd be in East London somewhere and a car would go past at 30 miles an hour and I know they should be looking that way but I can see their face. Because <laughs> they're doing this. Yeah, they, they, they can't compute what it is that they're seeing. And I like that because the dog is so unique it, it draws so much attention. My mentor at the time, Danny Lyons, who got me through all of my training and got me my first accreditation as a dog handler, 
said to me something one time when I came on the field with my first dog, working dog. And uh, there was guys doing all kinds of crazy stuff. It was fireworks and dogs running through it, biting the guys. Like, what, what are you here for? I was like, I don't know. I'll do some of that. He's like, are you trialing? Like, no. Are you selling dogs? No. I said, why are you doing that? This is for trial dog and it sells dogs. He said, train for your life. Train for your life. Because if you were training for all these things that you're watching that you like, but what makes your life up, you're not training for, then you're in a problem. Okay? And that stayed with me for a, for a long time, and I'm glad it did, because it makes a difference. Go forward. It, this, this is Eve. Okay? And these are the army lads sharing a biscuit or whatever that is on the side of this cliff face. And as you can see, they do some quite extreme things with her. I would not advise everybody to go and do this. But what I would say is that in China, these dogs, if you see some of the pictures, they're pretty much doing this anyway. Okay? And she handled that like, like it was nothing. So there's a lot of things you can do with these dogs, just from being in your house to going out and doing extreme sports or whatever you would refer to that as. A word one more? That one? Yes, please. Sorry, sorry, go back. Yes, and this one. So basically, all of this, although you may even go on my page and you may see me with my dog doing this, I can walk this dog down the road. I can have him around people. So if you can't do that, all of this doesn't make any sense at all. If you're not licensed, you shouldn't be doing it anyway because the laws in this country don't allow you to actually have a protection dog as much as people do talk about that. You're not. Uh, the future. We're at ground zero with these dogs. Anybody who has ever phoned me or messaged me or asked me about the dogs, I use that phrase all the time because that is where we are. All the foundation dogs that you see in England today have been founded by these kennels um, or the agent who works for us and they are the same people. There are, there are um, Sangshi First Dog Kennels, Golden Bass Kennels and there's about two agents that will work and source you these dogs. However, they are the same people and they fight amongst themselves. And we uh, realised that one of the, the first people who were selling us dogs at the time, one of them outed the other one and showed us a text and he was trying to sell us all related dogs because his ethic was that if we all re once we realise that we have related dogs uh, we'll have to come back to him if we don't know that we've got related dogs long before we come back to him we would have been breeding related dogs good thing we all fell out before that then yeah. Yeah? so <laughs> That was a joke, that was it. Um, in 2021, we created the Chinese Red Dog Registry. This was created for the exact purposes that we're talking about now. It sounds very expensive, but I'm gonna to explain to you why. We have packages from basic right up to gold. Nobody has to buy the gold, although the gold has a whole plethora of health testing which should be done and taken about because we know nothing about these dogs we know a bit more now that they've been here but we know a lot less than what you guys would know about your, your chunking dogs it has a mandatory DNA profiling clause if one breeder was willing to try and sell us related dogs knowingly and we know how they deal with dogs in China there's nothing to say and this is not to cause alarm but there's nothing to say that the foundation dogs at the top were not necessarily some way related to by themselves. The blood pool is tight here and it's relying on other people to import more dogs. However, puppies are being bred very quickly at the moment. It's okay with people who are close to the top and know people who are going to speak to the breeders and ask them if they decide that they want to put their hand into breeding. But all the people that are down the bottom who might just have a conversation themselves, I had many people message me, oh, is that dog related to this? Or, or even dogs that have nothing to do with it, is this dog related to that? If you don't know, and you just do it, well then you're entrenching this problem even more, you're making the blood worse. Not only that, we know that a number of dogs have come back with, as DM carriers, okay? So, 
One dog I know has full-blown DM and has been treated accordingly with that and will live out his life, but obviously we, we know what happens with that. If there are a number of dogs that are here that are not being tested and people are just banging them together, we're going to have a lot of dogs here with, with DM and be putting that through the breed. And Sorry, Julie. Could you tell people what DM is? Degenerative myelopathy. Okay. So, all right, so imagine you, we talk about hip dysplasia in this breed. Um, big, heavy, active dog, so it's likely, big boned, it's, gonna, it's, it's likely that it's going to have dis dysplasia or some sort of issue with hips, depending on how you treat it. But we also know that dysplasia is 50%. 50% environmental, 50% genetics, okay? Degenerative myelopathy is not, and there is no cure. So it's something that we should oust now, at the beginning. I got involved with this. The other guys, I'm only 50% of this, but I am the driving force in terms of the dogs. The other guys are not dog people. They are now, but they wasn't before. They are the business end of things. They, they created the website. They created all the other things, the data protection and stuff that we needed to adhere to to be able to do something like this. It's not, like I say, it's not to compete with the CKU. It's to run along with it and so that when we are we do get the opportunity to go to the CKU or the FCI, everything is there. Also, what it does is everybody who registers has their own portal, so you upload your own results, so everybody can see what dog it is. There's other additions to be added to it, such things as stud pages, so you won't be allowed to be on there unless you can show your health results on there, okay, and your DNA profile. Everybody who registers their dog will get 10% off from our partners. Our partners are La Blocklin. This code will get it for you. This is, this is viable until the 30th of November. La Blocklin is an animal genetic testing lab. They've partnered with us, which is brilliant, because they're willing and excited about doing things with us and being able to find out more about the breed. When, they do, when you do the first DNA profiling, that sample stays forever. So all you need to do if you decide you want to test for something is you send a message to us, they do it, They'll send you back the results and send us the results as well for your, for your uh, profile to be updated. We've put this here today because we want as many people as possible with Red Dogs to register. And I'll, I'll, we'll, we'll put, I'll put it on my page as well for people to see. 50% off the basic package. The basic package is £90, pounds, £99. Pounds. Um, so you're, after, you're paying about £50 pounds if you, if you um, buy into this today. 50 pounds is not a lot, that gets you your DNA profiling as well. All of this information needs to be gathered because if we're not doing this, then all we're doing really is owning dogs. And we're only gonna own this type of dog for a little while before it all goes down the pan. All goes down the pan. They're already in America. <clears throat> and they'll start growing in America very rapidly. They are in certain parts of Europe, but sporadically. One here, one there, one there. If they grow too fast and there is not no common consensus about what we're going to do or how we're going to move forward, we are going to ruin the breed. I don't want it to sound like I'm here to deliver bear doom and, groom and, and gloom. That's not what I want to do. But I have made this whole thing my life. It has actually taken over everything I do. I pretty much live in my kennels. I don't want this dog to go to pot because then it, what was it all for? You know? Um, Next page. Yeah, so this is this is basically this in a nutshell. Health testing is in is important, it's imperative. That doesn't stop with hips and elbows. It goes much further than that. Hips and elbows is great and you need to do it. Um, but the other stuff is very much important. DM is something that is horrible and you don't want to go through that with your dog, neither any other thing that might be in there that we don't know of. So the idea is that people register, you look, as the research comes in, it's a living, breathing thing, it changes. We've got, so for instance, the gold package has a whole load of health testing in there that will change after a period of time and we know, right, this hasn't been found anywhere in all of these lines, we'll take that out, we'll put something else in. Every six months, there'll be a random screening for something, which we will pick a number of dogs and for free, they will be screened from the samples that we already have. Um, <clears throat> and I think that way we can make sure that we're doing the best that we can do for this breed 
I think they are a really impressive breed and I don't think that you'll ever have a chance to have something so distinct and unique like this in the country again. Well, maybe not for a long time. China has a lot of different look looking dogs there. Um, but yeah, that is, that is pretty much what I have to say in a nutshell. Um, what I would like to say, the, the registry is international, by the way. You can do it anywhere. The only thing that differs is going to be the postal time for your results and stuff when you're sending DNA and getting it sent back. That's the only way you are. LeBlocklin is based in... It was based in Manchester, but they've recently moved, so I need to find out where it is. But either way, it doesn't matter. What I want to say is this. The dog world, dog community, can be very, very toxic at times. <laughs> and this man doesn't show. <laughs> Sorry, Junior. I had to throw that in. It's okay. <laughs> I think that it's okay. I've seen it. I've been working the, the, the Mallies and the Herders, and I see all the politics that goes on there. For ages. I just wanted to work my dog and get experience, so I, I didn't get involved there. I've thrown myself into the pulpit here and I seem to be actually involved in some of the politics that surround the Red Dogs. All I want is unity. If we allow sectarianism, fractionism and your allegiances to this breeder or that breeder to control what you do in terms of the benefit for your dog, then we're failing the dog. We don't have to like each other. All we need to do is work together for the, be for the better of the dog. This registration is here to do that. Even if you choose to go somewhere else and register your dog, okay, do it. But keep your information because at some point, hopefully, there'll be a point where we can all come together and do better for them. Okay? That's all I want to say. And thank you for having me.